Uh, hey everyone. Um, yeah, this is a bit of a different NEC from regularly, I think, and I think every speaker has probably mentioned that before. Um, the one thing that I do want to mention is that I truly miss being at NDC and I miss the floating stages they have in Oslo. Uh, so to make up for that, I have a big monitor and I mounted my webcam on top. And if I shake my desk a little bit, you can see the wobbly of the stage as well. So just to get the NDC feel a little bit. Anyway, welcome. And um, I see that I have a reminder as well. So let's join this meeting. That's fine. Uh, and let's start talking about microservices for building an IDE in uh, Rider. Now, it's very hard to do a show of hands, especially with a lot of webcams disabled, apparently. But just before we start, I would love to learn how many of you are using ReSharper or Rider are currently. And pop up in the chat, throw some, uh, some, some responses there. Say aye or no. Rider, yes, I see a couple of people. Great. So a couple of people are actually using Rider and ReSharper. Um, there's also a couple of people who are saying no, so that means that uh, I prepared well, and I have a small demo to start with uh, on what Rider is. And I'm not trying to sell you. Of course, I work at JetBrains. I'm not trying to sell you. Just want to give you a couple of insights into things that we will see later on during this talk and how they are implemented there. So Rider, for those of you who don't know, or those of you who only know ReSharper, Rider is an IDE that comes with ReSharper inside of the IDE. So it is really ReSharper with its own UI, its own functionality, and so on. And it has everything you expect from an IDE. There's a solution explorer on the left here. There's a database view on the right. There is a database changes window that you can open. There's Git integration. You can look at your unit tests. I don't have any in this solution, but still, you can see them if you have them. There's a NuGet tool window. Of course, there's an editor as well. There's all of the postfix templates from uh, ReSharper, for example. So if you do a for each, you get that thing. You can start writing for each person. You can say dot at NDC dot switch, for example, and have that expand. And then from there, you can generate all of those switch labels. So all of the things that you see in ReSharper are also in Rider. Plus also, if you are used to IntelliJ or any other IDE from JetBrains, you will already recognize the UI as well, because that's the same UI that we reuse here. So it's really the best of both worlds. But again, I told you I'm not here to make a, a commercial break about Rider, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what is in the UI and that there's a very rich editor that you can work with for C Sharp, for VB.net, for F Sharp, uh, and so on. Right, with that, this is my sales pitch. Um, if you're interested to do a trial, go to riderid.net slash Martin and give it a try. A couple of things that I do want to mention here as well is it is cross-platform. It works with any .NET version, so full framework, um, mono or .NET Core. And it even supports WinForms and WPF if you're using Windows. Uh, we also have a writer for C++ in preview. And as you may know, as a ReSharper user, there's ReSharper for C++. So we're now essentially bringing that into Rider as well so that you can use all of the refactorings that you're used to from ReSharper for C++ in Rider as well. All of that is quite lightweight. There's of course an IDE running and there's of course a ReSharper running in the back. And it's a full IDE built on IntelliJ and ReSharper. And as I mentioned, you get the best of both worlds there. Right. Now, before we dive into the technical things, I quickly want to give you a little bit of history about where JetBrains comes from and how Rider came about. Also, to get a little bit of a feel about why we made some technical choices later on while building uh, Rider. So, this is the first product that JetBrains released. Um, actually, JetBrains was called IntelliJ back then, and it's called IntelliJ Renamer. IntelliJ Renamer was literally nothing more than something that could look at your file system, open up a Java project and see which classes were used where and renaming classes. So that was all uh, we had back then. Uh, and I actually had to search quite a bit for, to find these very old screenshots, but still I managed to find them and it's, uh, it's kind of cool to see that. Um, that happened in 2000s. Um, JetBrains founded in Prague, came about with IntelliJ Renamer, and quite quickly, approximately a year after, we decided to ship IntelliJ as a full IDE where you could do editing and yeah, really write your Java code as well. Now, in 2004, we came about with ReSharper, and the main reason for that was to have like a second product in the company. Uh, IntelliJ was there, but also in 2004, 2003, 2004, uh, Eclipse started happening. And uh, that's, of course, an open source uh, IDE that people can use, and it's free as well. So we decided, okay, let's 
make sure that we can stay alive and also come up with uh, ReSharper, a .NET IDE or a .NET plugin. We didn't know at the time, and I'll cover that in a bit, but we came about with ReSharper then as well. Over the course of the years up till now, there's 20 plus IDEs that we have and other development tools. There's even a programming language Kotlin that you can use. Uh, so it's grown quite a bit um, since, uh, since the beginning there. Now, ReSharper, I mentioned when we started building that thing, we did not yet know whether it was going to be a plugin to Visual Studio or if it was going to be its own IDE. So um, what we did back then was basically start building a code base that could work both ways. That could be an IDE by itself or could be a plugin to Visual Studio. So this is uh, the ReSharper IDE. We never shipped this thing, but uh, some people may have seen screenshots because I, I think we released some nightly builds back then. Uh, but what you see is a WinForms-based IDE that has a solution explorer, an editor that can render inline uh, comments. And this is actually a funny thing. The comments that you see on screen here, um, those comments are now also rendered like this in IntelliJ. So almost 20 years later, we finally come full circle and have them uh, in there as well in the editor. But it's actually quite amazing that all of this was done in WinForms. And since we decided, well, we didn't decide actually what this was going to be, its own ID or a plugin, uh, we had a code base that was loosely enough um, to, to yeah, build either product we wanted to do. So the ReSharper IDE didn't come about in the end, so we shipped ReSharper as a plugin to Visual Studio. But all of the functionality that we built, like this uh, test runner or the usages window that you see, and the fact that you have an abstract syntax tree on top of the editor and everything you type in the, in the editor, has not gone to waste. Uh, it was reused inside of Visual Studio as the plugin, and we kept all of that functionality um, separately. The nice thing about that is that we were also able to use those things to accommodate not only the latest Visual Studio, but every single Visual Studio version since 2010. And actually, I think if you install the latest ReSharper into Visual Studio 2013, that should still work. Uh, we, we support all of those versions thanks to the fact that those things were loosely coupled, or at least loosely coupled between Visual Studio versions, because they're not really loosely coupled from uh, Visual Studio too much. Um, we also ship the ReSharper command line tools, where we basically took the code analysis engine and ship it as a command line tool that you can run using uh, a .NET client tool and basically run the analyzers on top of your code base. So all of those things came about thanks to the fact that back then we didn't know whether to ship an IDE or a plugin to Visual Studio. Right. Now, at NDC, this is actually NDC London, I think, uh, we very often have booths where people can come and ask us questions. And one of the questions that came about uh, a couple of years ago was, when will JetBrains come with its own .NET IDE? You have this ReSharper thing, why not make your own IDE? And we've always been saying no up until uh, 2016, I think, or 2015, where we decided, hmm, well, maybe we should come up with our own IDE. Um, the question came about, a lot of people were asking for this. Uh, ReSharper was getting performance issue thanks to the fact that Visual Studio is a 32-bit process, and that's a very long discussion. I'm not going to go into that, but suffice to say that uh, both Microsoft and us and other plugins and extensions are basically fighting for memory inside of Visual Studio, and uh, the garbage collector is doing overtime inside of the IDE there. Also, the fact that new features come up in Visual Studio and very often show up late in the product development cycle means that ReSharper would also be a little bit behind on implementing some things that uh, Visual Studio did not yet ship in their nightlies. So that also made it difficult. And we decided, OK, with .NET Core coming, with all of those things that uh, we realized over the years, maybe it would be good to come up with our own IDE. And if we come up with our, own, with our own IDE, there's no IDE for .NET Core yet back then. Definitely not one that was good and consistent cross-platform, so let's build this thing. So we decided let's build a cross-platform IDE. Cross-platform means that you also need a cross-platform UI toolkit. And as you remember from the screenshot from the ReSharper IDE, uh, you will have seen that the ReSharper UI was built with WinForms and WPF. And it's kind of hard to get that running on Linux or Mac OS X. So we decided, OK, let's look at the existing ReSharper UI. What can we do there? Um, what if we would build our own IDE on top of ReSharper? Would we use WinForms? That kind of works on Mono. 
uh, would we use GTQ Sharp or Qt or something like that so that it can run cross-platform? We decided it's basically rebuilding all of the uh, all of the UIs. Maybe not the best idea. It's it's one of those big rewrites kind of projects, and it's hard to do, and it basically takes a long time before you actually finish it if you manage to finish it over time. We started thinking. We have this IntelliJ IDE, and actually IntelliJ as an IDE is also an open source project. I'll cover that in a bit. Uh, we have this IntelliJ IDE that is already cross-platform. We built all of the other IDEs on top of that. So why not try to build ReSharper for IntelliJ so that we have that cross-platform UI framework and we only have to uh, care about integrating all of the uh, editor actions and refactorings and code analysis and so on. So we decided let's go with that. IntelliJ as a platform, not as an IDE, is the foundation for all of the IDEs we have. Uh, it has a project view, there's code completion in there, there's editors in there, there's a UI toolkit that you can use. So for example, if you want to render a dialogue, that thing is going to be in the IntelliJ platform. And typically when we ship an IDE, we take that platform, we bundle some of the plugins that we have, like version control, like the terminal, like um, yeah, a, a lot of other things, Docker integration, for example. And then we add all of the specific functionality to a certain language. So if you take, for example, WebStorm, that's going to be uh, the IntelliJ platform with all of those plugins and JavaScript, TypeScript, and uh, other language support in there. IntelliJ platform is an open source project. And if you want to build your own IDE, you can use it to build your own. Uh, there's Comma IDE, for example, that uh, did that. I saw Perl IDE at some point as well. And Android Studio, if you're an Android developer, Android Studio is actually a IDE created by Google, but they are using the IntelliJ platform as their foundation uh, as the open source projects. So it is there. It works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. It's already cross-platform thanks to the Java virtual machine because IntelliJ is Java-based, the JVM is running this thing. Now, JVM, that's an interesting one. IntelliJ, on one hand, has the JVM, and it's a good foundation, works cross-platform, the editor is there, and so on. And we had ReSharper, on the other hand, where we wanted to yeah, bring ReSharper into that IDE, but ReSharper is built in .NET. All of the language features in there are built on .NET, so it is really a .NET code base. So you have JVM and .NET. How do you combine them? So we started looking at options. Uh, one option was to rewrite ReSharper in Java so that we could just plug in the C Sharp code inspections inside of uh, IntelliJ by rewriting ReSharper in Java. Now imagine, I mentioned the big rewrite for the UI. Imagine rebuilding 16 years of development on the ReSharper code base and redoing that in Java. That's probably not going to work. Also, if you would have a JVM version of uh, ReSharper and a C Sharp version, you would have two implementations. How do you make sure that all of the same bugs exist on either side? How do you make sure that the same features exist on either, si either side? And how do you keep them in sync at all times? Uh, we have been thinking about an automatic conversion because C Sharp kind of looks like Java, uh, but we decided to not go with that. On the other hand, thanks to having that uh, ReSharper ID back in the days, and thanks to having that command line ReSharper, we already knew that we could run ReSharper without the UI. We could run ReSharper as a command line process, looking at your C-sharp code base and so on, and just build our own UI on top. And I'm saying just build our own UI on top because that has its own uh, interesting aspects there. So a headless ReSharper as a language server, would be cool. And we could make that cross-platform because you have .NET on Windows and .NET Core on Mac OS and Linux. And actually, in the future, we're also going to run uh, ReSharper inside of Rider on top of .NET Core, but that's not yet the case. Um, there's no constraints. We're not inside of a host uh, where we have to respect the memory space and so on. We're inside our own host, so we can use 64 bits, allocate as much memory as we want, and do pretty much anything we want. And the cool thing is also that it is ReSharper. So if you would build Rider on top of that headless ReSharper, it's the same product, it's the same code base. So if we create a new inspection in ReSharper, it would show up in Rider. If we would create a new uh, analyzer in Rider, it would show up in ReSharper. So that's a very nice side aspect of that. And then on top of that headless ReSharper, we would put uh, IntelliJ as a very thin UI. Now, IntelliJ as a thin UI is an interesting choice. Um, it would control the ReSharper process, but IntelliJ itself, itself is not really a thin UI. 
IntelliJ itself is an IDE. It has an editor, it has refactorings, it has inspections for XML and, and all of those things. Uh, and we would plug ReSharper underneath and ReSharper would come with its own set of features very often for similar languages because ReSharper also obviously uh, supports XML and for example, HTML and CSS. So IntelliJ was not really a thin UI. It was a full IDE with a new uh, IDE underneath. We looked at that and we thought, okay, this is probably going to be challenging, but it might actually make sense to do this and combine two IDEs together into a new product. Because there are cases where IntelliJ can do its own thing on the front end and ReSharper in the back is not really needed. There are also cases where ReSharper can do everything and IntelliJ is not really needed. So for example, scanning your entire code base, uh, your entire C-sharp code base, doesn't really matter if, um, if IntelliJ doesn't do anything at that point because it's all C-sharp based, right? But what with features that we could combine? What if there could be a interesting feature where we could combine something that happens in ReSharper with something that happens in IntelliJ? And that's where uh, we came up with the decision to combine the two IDs. And I'm going to quickly show a couple of places where this happens. So uh, I have this project and I already showed you the editor. And we have an HTML file in this project as well. Now, this is Rider. And all of the HTML syntax highlighting and so on, the fact that you can preview the color here, the fact that you can um, invoke new actions on that thing and rename a tag to, for example, style two or something like that. All of these things come from the IntelliJ side of Rider. There's no ReSharper involved in this thing other than the fact that ReSharper knows this file exists so that it can reference it if needed but it doesn't do a thing here with uh, suggesting any of the things that you have here. So all of the code completion you would do if you would write a new div or if you would use uh, Emmet, for example, if you would do something like this, makes no sense at all, but all of this is powered by IntelliJ. There's also cases where both of the IDs are actually working. So HTML is typically powered by IntelliJ. What if you have a Razor page? Razor is a combination of typically HTML there's some C sharp in there as well. And there can be CSS, JavaScript, and probably some other things in there as well. So how do you do this? Well, um, this thing is basically IntelliJ providing all of the HTML syntax highlighting, whereas ReSharper is making sure that when I'm in a Razor context, I can actually get code completion and refactoring on those things. Uh, so it's, it's really combining the two IDEs. Another thing uh, that we can combine is the fact that we can have a controller if we make a database connection that is completely on the IntelliJ side of things, what we could do is detect that in our C-sharp code base, we have a string. And inside of that string, we can start completing based on your database. So we can use, um, we, can, we can look at columns or we can get uh, the ID from person or something like that. So you get all of that completion inside of that string. So this is really cool because all of this is handled by ReSharper, apart from this string, because that string is handled by the IntelliJ side of things. So it's really two IDEs contributing to the same thing as well. Um, I see a feature question in the chat. Uh, does Rider support Blazor as well? Yes, it does, but it's not yet on par with what you would expect. And uh, the next feature or the next release is going to contain uh, more of that, because that's one of those cases where we have to rework a couple of things, but it's coming. Right. One plus one equals three. So that's uh, that's right. Now, if you think of two IDEs and you think of two IDEs that have their own functionality that is even similar, how do you make those two talk together? Well, we uh, have been looking at several options for inter-process communication. But before we did so, we started looking at the typical actions that you could do in the IDE. So imagine a context action. You press Alt-Enter when there's a light bulb and you see that menu drop down with all of the options that are there. What you see on this screenshot is a lot of things coming from a lot of sites. IntelliJ brings you the text editor, the fact that you can have a caret in there and do your typing, the fact that you can press Alt-Enter, and the fact that the document is tied to a language. So if we press Alt-Enter, what will happen is that IntelliJ will ask the current documents, what's your language? Are you HTML, uh, JavaScript, CSS, or whatever? And in this case, because it's C-sharp codes, we have plugged in a uh, facade that says, 
I'm C sharp. What that facade is going to do is communicate with ReSharper, run the inspection, see whatever is possible there, and ReSharper is going to report back all of the things that should be visible in that drop down that opens when you press Alt Enter. And IntelliJ will then render those things, and if we invoke them, IntelliJ will, of course, invoke them and maybe communicate back to ReSharper that we have renamed something or executed the refactoring. Sounds complicated, but if you look at it, it's really the data going over the wire between IntelliJ and Rider is going to be a tree, a tree of action IDs, what can we do, a tree of names so that we have something to show in the UI, and icons. That's everything that is going over the wire. Both sides can do their own intelligence on top of this, and they will probably keep track of where we are in the documents, but everything going over the wire, or that has to go over the wire, is a very simple tree of nodes that provides whatever is in this menu. And if we invoke an action, we have the ID, so we can call back into ReSharp and say, look, execute this ID on this document. Writing code is another interesting one. Uh, writing code is bidirectional. You can be typing. And if you type such a, um, a postfix template where you say I have this collection dot for each, for example, what will happen is that ReSharper will expand all of that into a for each loop. You're still typing in IntelliJ. At the same time, ReSharper is typing in IntelliJ by expanding that, uh, that postfix templates. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting. There's also more complex refactorings if you do a rename that may touch all, every single document that you have in your solution. You're typing in IntelliJ, ReSharp is doing its thing on the back uh, end, and yeah, those things have to happen together. You could think of a solution to uh, implement all of this with deltas, like this range in the document has changed and we're updating the other range and so on. Uh, and that's actually what we are doing. IntelliJ pushes the delta to ReSharper and back and forth. So it's really not the entire document going over the wire, but just the things that are being changed still begs the question, how do you handle concurrency? How do you handle the fact that you may still be typing in IntelliJ, but ReSharper is injecting something into the text that you have been typing? I'll cover that in, uh, in a bit. But essentially, writing code is sending deltas over the wire from IntelliJ to ReSharper and uh, back and forth, saying what line are we at, what column are we at in the documents, what's the end of the thing that we are typing or refactoring and the text that should replace it. That's pretty much everything going over the wire. So if you look at the data types, they're not really that complex. Uh, for those context actions, we had an ID, name, and an icon. For inspections, it would be very similar. You would have an ID, a name, an icon, maybe the severity so we know which color of squiggle to show underneath your code. Um, and that's pretty much it. So very simple messages. And if we could make one inspection work, if we could make one inspection work in ReSharper and contribute to IntelliJ, we could make them all work because it's the same type of data that we could uh, generalize this into. Then we started thinking, okay, we know which data has to be communicated. How can we do this? Uh, which protocol are we gonna use? How do we make the actual connection happen between the two products? And back then, also Visual Studio came about and uh, the language server protocol came about, LSP, that uh, VS Code is using. And that's a really interesting protocol because it was built for IDEs. Um, the language server protocol has a notion about languages. It has a notion about diagnostics and, and inspections that you can send back and forth. Uh, there's the concept of documents. There's a lot of similarity between what we do and what LSP could provide although LSP was too limited for us. Uh, ReSharper would at some point have to contribute a view or a UI. If you do a refactoring, we would have to contribute UI uh, to IntelliJ, and that is not part of LSP. Now, LSP is extensible enough that we could build or we could have built our own uh, extensions on top of LSP, but the downside of that is that we would have had to build a lot of extensions. And essentially, it would boil down to shoehorning our own extensions on top of LSP, where the fraction of LSP that we would be usual, uh, really using in our products would not be ideal. So we decided to abandon LSP and go with something else. And we decided to try all sorts of things. We've had a REST kind of protocol that did JSON, which was slow. We did protobuf, which had all kinds of serialization issues. If you would have nightly builds and the front end and the back end would be at a different version. We tried RPC, we tried request response style, just like you would have a web API. So we tried literally 
everything that is available. And we found all of that, um, yeah, annoying. Because both LSP and those custom protocols that we came up with are mostly request response, RPC. I make a call from IntelliJ to ReSharper, or ReSharper makes a call from, uh, from ReSharper to IntelliJ and gets a response back. That means that if you do those RPC calls, you would also have to send context. Which solution are we in? Which project are we in? Which file is open? What is the location in code? If you have multiple cursors or multiple selection, what bits are selected and so on. So a lot of additional context would have to go with every request and response cycle, which means that the protocol would be very, very high bandwidth or bandwidth intensive. So we started realizing that requests doing something and then returning a response would probably not be the best idea, uh, idea in this case, because all of that context, or at least most of that context, could be reused on subsequent calls. If you're still in the same project, why send all of the solution information together with, uh, with the requests if you could also keep it somewhere else, because it doesn't change that often, typically. Um, since both IDs share a similar model and architecture, they come from the same vendor, so they, they were built along the same lines. Since those things are the same, what if we could come up with something that is not RPC, but um, has context, has states, and that just communicates between the same type of component on both sides? Or if it's not the same, what if we could do something that is a very thin wrapper around it so it looks the same to the protocol? And that's where MVVM, Model View Controller, comes in. We decided IntelliJ is going to be our view, ReSharper will provide the model, and our view model will be where Rider lives. So Rider, in its core, is really just a view model. And ReSharper is contributing to it, IntelliJ is using it and contributing to it, and it's, it's all shared um, between both sides. If you have such a view model, you can have something like a project object, and that project object can have a files collection, and you can add a file called foo.cs into that files collection. Both sides would look at the same view model, and both sides would all of a sudden know that foo.cs was added to the project. If there's a new inspection to be added from the ReSharper site or from the IntelliJ site, if you have that kind of mixed language um, editor, well, find the file in the project view model, add an inspection to the collection and say what its severity is, what the line and column in the code is and show it there. Both processes can subscribe to this view model and react to every change that happens there. Whether it's ReSharper pushing something in there or IntelliJ doing something with the view model, both are subscribed to every collection and every single object that is in that model. There's still the question of conflict resolution, and uh, we did a lot of over-engineering on that before we decided that it's actually pretty simple. If you make changes in IntelliJ and you're typing and ReSharper pushes the refactoring results into IntelliJ, but you've changed the document, the last one will win. So that's what we do. Every single call to the protocol gets a message, uh, a message version, and based on the version, we basically pick the latest version to make sure that we have a convention in place to discard changes that are not required in, uh, in the view model. Right, meet the rider protocol. So that's what we're actually uh, here for. So uh, I have a nice diagram, and it's always nice if diagrams contain the word magic, because that's what we wanted this protocol to look like for our developers. Yes, we have both sides. Each uses a different type of uh, platform and language even, we wanted to have that protocol and our developers should not really care about the protocol too much. Um, they would not have to know about conflict resolution, about the types that it supports, about the fact that the connection may break or ReSharper may crash or IntelliJ may crash while the other uh, process is still running. The protocol should handle all of those cases in a magic style so the developer should not know. To do that, we built our own writer protocol. It's actually open source. There's not a lot of documentation, unfortunately, but it is open source and you can look at it. And it comes with uh, bindings for .NET, for Kotlin, for JavaScript and C++. And as you can imagine, for .NET, that's there because we have ReSharper. For Kotlin is because that's a JVM language and we have the IntelliJ side of things. For C++ is because we have that writer C++ coming. So we're gradually adding uh, new languages there whenever we need them. Uh, if you look at the protocol, 
you will see various different layers. Uh, you will have sockets, the fact that you can have batching, there's a binary wire protocol that is being generated, there's that conflict resolution and so on. On top of those things, you have types like strings, booleans, lists, and so on. On top of that, we have a model definition, and on top of that, there's code generation that the developer can use. And I'll actually show you some, uh, some examples later on. Uh, but the idea is that if you're a developer on the ReSharper team or on the Rider team, what you will have to do is include the protocol libraries, if they're not there yet, write a view model in that model definition DSL, the main specific language uh, layer, based on that generate code, and on each side of the fence work with that generated code. So if you create that DSL language, you're actually writing that in a Kotlin-like uh, DSL. You generate the code. If you're on the .NET side of things and you have a collection, it will show up as a list. If you're on the Kotlin side, it may show up as a map or something else uh, based on what is being generated. And you can just work with the uh, standard types. There's no need to use any custom types. It's all just Kotlin or just .NET or just C++. Right. As a developer, you would only need to know about uh, the data types that are in there, how you can write your model. And you should not know about conflict resolution, the wire protocol, and everything that is underneath there. Uh, also, the fact that code is generated based on that view model means that there's no reflection or introspection on the Java side of things happening at runtime. It's really static code. It's being generated, compiled, and that's the code that is going over the wire or, or handling the, the wire connection. So no reflection needed to make sure that everything is parsed. Uh, the writer protocol is also hierarchical and supports lifetimes and that sounds complex and i'll show you that uh, in a little bit uh, it's basically the way ides work uh, you have a hierarchy of components on both sides and when you close a window for example you want to make sure that everything that is attached to that window also gets disposed so you don't have any memory leaks and so on in terms of primitives in the protocol, you have things like lists, there's fields, there's uh, bytes, shorts, ints, all of the different types that you would expect in, uh, in any language. And there's two special types, or actually three, signals, properties, and calls slash callbacks. Calls and callbacks are for the cases where you still need an RPC call to happen and do a blocking request response kind of thing. We try to avoid them, but sometimes you need them. Signal and property are the main constructs of everything that happens in, uh, in the protocol because a property is an observable. You can subscribe on either side to a property and see what value changes and what the value looks like after it changed. And there's signals that is basically events being emitted. So if there's a signal from the front end to the back end saying the file system has been updated, for example, the back end or the front end can reload certain files or certain directories uh, if needed. What do they look like in c -sharp code? Well, uh, you have your event sources or your signals, and they can fire, which means I emit an event, or they can advise, subscribe to something, and invoke a handler whenever something happens. And a property or a signal is nothing more than uh, something that combines both and that can fire an event, but also listen to changes happening. Also note the fact that there's that lifetime um, lifetime variable or parameter in that uh, sync. I mentioned everything is hierarchical and has lifetimes, which means if you subscribe to parts of the view model, but that view model part is no longer needed, it will be disposed. And what will happen is that that lifetime will also get disposed and all of the handlers, all of the subscriptions will follow along. So you don't have to manually go in and uh, remove all of the uh, all of the subscriptions there. Right, a property is nothing more than a combination of both sides plus the value that it holds, the current value that it holds, uh, so nothing special there. Now in hierarchies, on the IntelliJ side, you have a project, on the ReSharper side, you have a solution, and we have lifetimes on both sides of the equation. So for example, if you have a project open and you have three editor tabs, well, all of that is gonna be loaded in uh, IntelliJ. It's also gonna be loaded in ReSharper. When you close a project, you want all of those editor tabs to disappear from memory as well. Now, since you are in this split brain kind of situation where you have IntelliJ and ReSharper, if you close a project on the IntelliJ side, you want to propagate that entire lifetime to the ReSharper side of things as well so that you close the solution there. 
that's why the protocol also comes with these lifetimes embedded, basically making sure that if you close something on one end or dispose something on one end, it will also disappear on the other side. And that works both ways. What does that look like in codes? Well, a lifetime is actually a very, very simple construct. You have a stack of actions that will be executed when you dispose the lifetime. You can attach things to a lifetime. So if you have a project that opens a tab, the project has a project lifetime. The new editor tab will subscribe to the project lifetime and basically attach to it. Whenever the project closes, it calls dispose, walks its entire internal stack and disposes all of the child resources there. So it's not super complex. Um, it's really just making sure that instead of having to litter your entire code base with using statements and making sure you have disposables being passed around, this is the inverse where everything subscribes to a main disposable, much like you would subscribe to a cancellation token in, uh, in C Sharp. And whenever that thing fires, you continue propagating the chain of, uh, of disposables. Right. Let's uh, look at some codes because I know this is very theoretical and uh, let's look at some codes. So this is again writer. And if we look at the NuGet tool window in there, you can see packages and you can install and uninstall packages. And there's also a log tab. Now this log tab lists all kinds of log messages. So for example, it tells you how it's authenticating with the current NuGet feed. It tells you when it's restoring packages and so on. Now, if you look at it, the UI is all IntelliJ, whereas this data is all coming from the .NET side. We're actually using NuGet under the hood, making sure that this propagates into that, uh, into that tool window and that we can see those log files. So let's see how this is built in the protocol and how both the IntelliJ side as well as the ReSharper side uh, look at this thing. So if you look at the uh, IntelliJ side, and I mentioned both IDs look the same, they really look the same because it's all IntelliJ. So IntelliJ, look at the icon, that's where you see the difference or the languages. Um, in IntelliJ, in the IntelliJ side of Rider, we wrote a DSL object called the RD NuGet host. We prefix everything with RD when it's something that lives in the view model or something that is going to be the view model and we'll have a NuGet host in there. We're extending an existing object in the protocol, namely the solution, and we're calling our extension NuGet host. Inside of that thing, we can start describing our entire protocol. So for example, we can see that a NuGet package identity has an ID and a version, both are fields of the string type. And that's a structure definition in the protocol. There's a NuGet framework, there's a package dependency, all kinds of things. And at some point, there also should be a log message. And a log message can have a timestamp, can have a context, which is going to be an enum, can have a level, which is also going to be an enum, um, that is the level, and a message that will be written. Also, further down, there should be a sync called log, and that is an immutable list of those NuGet log messages. So in our protocol definition, we are writing using the protocol constructs to define the objects that we have, uh, all using types that we can use. And the nice thing is that because all of this is also Kotlin based, we can invoke refactorings on top of this. So for example, if you want to make this a signal, if you want to make this an RPC call, we can easily rename that and change the protocol to do that. Now bear with me. We have that RD NuGet log message, which is that structure with the text, with the severity and so on. And we have a sync called log. What will happen after we define the model is that we generate code using an action that we have in the IDE. And we get back a pre-generated Kotlin file that is the Kotlin version of the model that we just created. So if you would look at our uh, log message, you will actually see that uh, we have that log sync that we just defined in the protocol, which is going to be a signal that listens to a list of RD NuGet log messages, all using types that exist on the Kotlin side of things. If we now switch to the ReSharper code base, you will see that that same thing is generated, but this time as C Sharp. And also on this side, you will see that there's something called log. Go away. There's something called log that is a list of RD NuGet log messages in C-sharp and that can fire whenever it changes. So that's what we did in the protocol, define those types and the protocol 
really translates everything in something into something that can be used in the actual language that we are using. So for uh, C sharp, you will see a nice C sharp based RD NuGet log message. Now, what will happen is when we fire up your project, when we start your project, we will subscribe to everything that is happening, including NuGet restores. And to do so, we have implemented a NuGet native logger that we plug into the .NET runtime and the NuGet clients that is uh, coming from .NET. And whenever that thing emits a log message, we actually forward it to our host, log, fire, a new message with the contents that we have. So this is how we essentially subscribe the NuGet.core DLL to our protocol. And whenever NuGet emits a message, we basically pipe it into the protocol and fire new events. Now, these events are fired. We can subscribe to them on the ReSharper site if you want to, but we can also subscribe to them on the IntelliJ site again. So on the IntelliJ site, we have that NuGet log panel. And in that log panel, we also subscribe to our, uh, where is it? To our log. And we actually renamed it full log in here because it's wired up somewhere. But anyway, bear with me. This is that log property that comes from the protocol. Whenever it fires, we get a message and we simply add it to a UI. That's everything we do here. We subscribe to the protocol. NuGet on their C Sharp site fires something into this, um, into this event. We get the message and we add it to the console. Nothing more than that. Uh, one additional thing that I quickly want to show you is this concept of lifetimes. Also on NuGet, uh, you can have authenticated feeds on MyGit, on uh, Azure DevOps, or whatever you are using. And to do that, we can also plug in credential providers so that when you consume, for example, Azure DevOps, we will trigger an OAuth flow, maybe ask you to log in so that you can consume the packages that you have on your uh, NuGet feed there. Now, all of that is solution specific. If you open up one solution, well, what you get in our NuGet credential provider host is the lifetime of our solution. And to that lifetime, we can subscribe. When the lifetime terminates, we say that we also want to remove our credential service from memory and clean up that entire credential service. Also, um, if any one of you experienced a NuGet issue in, I think it was Rider 2018.2 or 3, we had a small memory leak in one of the minor versions that was because I forgot this specific line of codes. And we kept that credential service in memory forever. And if you did not close the writer, it would be in memory forever. So it's really important to subscribe to those lifetimes. Once we do that, we clean up that credential service. Uh, there's a couple of other examples in the code base. So you can subscribe a disposable. But if you have an action that has to be executed when you uh, close or terminate the lifetime, you can also write some custom codes, link a method, do whatever you want whenever that lifetime closes, like for example, cleaning up temporary files or whatever you want to do with it. Right, and I think that's, that's a quick rough overview of how the protocol works and uh, what it does. So let's go back to slides. <laughs> Right, so in summary of that protocol, it's a Kotlin-based DSL, easy to work with for our devs. They update the view model, regenerate code, and simply work with the code on both sides, whether it's in the IntelliJ code base or the ReSharper code base. They don't have to think about the fact that there is this multiple processes thing running. They don't have to think about states, about conflict resolution. All of that is already in the protocol. It's cross-platform and also cross-language. So if you want to create a React client on top of uh, the ReSharper code base, probably not the best idea, but if you would want to do this, you can do so if you want. There's one downside to having this protocol, and that is that the plugin model for Rider is more complex than the one for IntelliJ or ReSharper separately, because it means that you as a plugin developer also have, may have to extend the protocol and may have to build something that sits inside of IntelliJ and on the ReSharper side. So that's why which are our writer plugins are slightly more complex. Uh, we have F Sharp support open source. If you want to see how that's done, uh, the ReSharper and Unity integration is also open source. And there we actually have a protocol extension into the Unity editor as well. And uh, the Azure tools for Intelli for uh, Rider, uh, I'm actually working on that with a, with a colleague. 
and uh, we are in process of porting parts of what we did on the front end. We're now also making sure that that runs on the ReSharper side so we can do more interesting things with the code you do in, in functions, for example. But it's all open source. If you want to have a look at how it works, how the protocol is generated, uh, that's all in there. Right, uh, we are 44 minutes in, and I mentioned in the talk title that this was going to be about microservices, and 44 minutes later, we're done with the introduction. Here are the microservices. Um, we already have microservices based on the fact that we have two processes. We have IntelliJ running, we have ReSharper running, they communicate together, and Rider is the product that combines both. The nice thing about having those two processes is the fact that they each have their own 64-bit memory space, which means that IntelliJ can use 64 bits, ReSharper can do so, and they can garbage collect whenever they want, independent from each other. So if IntelliJ has to run garbage collection, be my guest, you can do so. If ReSharper wants to do so, that can happen at any point in time as well. Also brings a couple of complexities in terms of making sure that the protocol can respond and doesn't time out. But again, that's something that the protocol handles for you. So you don't have to care. The fact that these things are their own process also means that in theory, they can run on multiple cores if you have a multi-core machine, which a lot of people have nowadays. So that means that one core can run ReSharper and one core can run IntelliJ. Both processes can start and stop independently. And actually, if you open up Rider and you see the welcome screen in there, at that point in time, only the IntelliJ side of things has started. It's only when you start opening a solution or looking at the new item or new project templates that we spin up the ReSharper host to make sure that we can provide that data uh, to the front end. If you're debugging in Rider, we're already at four processes. You have IntelliJ and ReSharper, but also your application that is running. And to attach to your application, we actually launch a, a third process that sits in between ReSharper and your application. So we can look at what is happening in the application, pipe that into ReSharper, and ReSharper pipes that into uh, the IntelliJ side of things. Gets more interesting. We were thinking if our debugger already uses this thing and our debugger can contribute to the view model that IntelliJ and ReSharper share, what if we could uh, push more things into that model? What if more processes could subscribe to that model or maybe even contribute to that model. And that's what we did with our WPF preview. So if you're doing WPF in Rider, you get XAML editing, you get refactoring in XAML and so on, but you also get a XAML preview. That preview window is its own process. Whenever you open up a XAML uh, window in, uh, in Rider and you open up that preview tab, we actually launch a preview process. That thing will read the XAML from uh, the current view model, render everything as a bitmap, push that back into the view model, and then Rider can show it there. So we have something there. This also means that if you're not using WPF or not doing anything WPF related, we also don't have to launch that entire process. All we have to know is that there's XAML, and when we open up XAML and the preview window, we have to start that process and subscribe to the model. The view model is shared or can be shared across processes, which means that if you have um, a solution that contains Roslyn analyzers, and a lot of people write their own analyzers in Roslyn, Rider is ReSharper based, which means we don't use Roslyn. We have our own inspections and code analysis and code completion and so on. But still, we wanted to be able to support custom extensions or custom analyzers that people may have written. So what we do is we look at the references of your projects, if we see there's Roslyn analyzers in there, we spin up a Roslyn host. The Roslyn host also gets access to that entire view model, can subscribe to it, but also contribute to it. And when your Roslyn analyzer has an inspection to report, what it can do is simply, again, contribute an ID, name, icon, severity to the view model, and we can render it in Rider. Same thing when you invoke it, it shows up in the list, you invoke that ID, ReSharper knows it's not one of its own IDs, so it pipes it into the view model again, and the Roslyn host can subscribe to that event and do its thing with, uh, with the code base and do the exact same dance. So uh, you can actually see this if you have a uh, Roslyn inspection and you open up a process monitor, you will see that a jetbrains.resharper.roslyn worker is being started. And when you don't have those things, that thing will not be started. So it really depends on what you have in the project. Right, we have that protocol. We can share view models. 
it's all socket based, which also means that in theory, we can run across network boundaries on multiple machines. And actually, if you do Docker debugging or remote debugging, that is what is happening. We ship the debugger process into your Docker VM. We attach to your application running in Docker, and that thing is all communicating using the same view model and reporting everything back to, uh, to the writer IDE. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Unity, same thing. Unity is probably our uh, most insane implementation of how we use the protocol because you have Rider. We have a Unity plugin to Rider, but we also have a Unity plugin to the Unity editor, which is not uh, from JetBrains, but we have to plug in there to get certain information. So what we do is we have a shared view model with that Unity editor. We also have a shared view model with the game that you are developing in the Unity uh, editor. We also have a debugger process listening to that application, but also listening to ReSharper. So it's really view model shared across many, many microservices. Now, the cool thing about doing this, and again, this is open source if you want to look into how this was done. The cool thing about this is that none of these things have to know about um, request response. They just subscribe to the view model. And again, you don't have to uh, be aware of everything that goes on uh, under the covers if you are developing for this plugin. Nice thing is we can do some very cool things. Like for example, this is Rider. And what we do is we are doing a find usages on a button click handler. Now this is all on the C sharp side of things, but that button itself will be a visual element that you may have in your Unity 3D game. So what we can do by having that view model, by sharing all of this data uh, through that view model is that when we find usages of that button click handler, and I'll play the video so you can see it. What will happen is if we do a find usages, we jump to the Unity editor and we immediately highlight that button that you subscribe this thing to in the game engine. So that's, uh, that's one of the really nice ways, I think, of, uh, of using this protocol. Right, so let's talk a little bit about the future. We've seen what is in there now. Um, the fact that we have this protocol also made us think about certain things that we could do in the future. Some of the things that I'm about to show you are in Rider, partially in Rider. Others may never see the light of day. So be advised, this is all um, partially playing with the protocol, partially actual implementation in the product, but also partial just thinking what we can do with it. Right. We are thinking about, and actually already using this one, modeling views. Uh, I mentioned that we have ReSharper, and in ReSharper, we may have a C Sharp interactive uh, settings tool window. Well, we want to have that in Rider and in ReSharper. So why would we have to build this UI in Swing on the Java side and in WPF on the ReSharper side? What if we could have a code generator for that UI that we can simply pipe headers, uh, lines, string options, Boolean options as, as radio buttons and so on, on that protocol and render that regardless of which uh, UI is rendering it. And we're actually using this already. So that's a, that's a cool addition that we made there. The multiple machine story is also interesting. This is pure speculation, uh, but what if you were developing on a Mac, but you had a Windows VM somewhere or an actual Windows machine somewhere? What if we could run that WPF renderer process on a different machine and just pipe that bitmap as a preview to your Mac OS X uh, machine? That would be really nice because that would mean you could build Windows desktop applications in Rider on your Mac, get a preview from Windows, but still develop everything on your Mac. Uh, another idea that we may or may not be working on uh, is having the front end on one machine and the back end on another. What if there could be a very beefy machine in your home network or in a cloud somewhere that could run your entire ReSharper backend and you have IntelliJ subscribing to the view model that that thing exposes. So that's also something that may happen or may not happen. Um, this is one of the crazier ideas and this is definitely one that we're not uh, pursuing. Uh, one of the ideas that we had was, what if we extend all of our IDEs with this process or uh, with this protocol and make every IDE both a client and a server and expose the view model and subscribe to that view model? A couple of interesting scenarios there could be that if you have Visual Studio with the ReSharper plugin, ReSharper could launch WebStorm in the background, 
subscribe to the view model and sync everything that is required with WebStorm and pipe all of that back into Visual Studio. What if WebStorm also could subscribe to everything that is in ReSharper and maybe handle the occasional Razor templates while you have Visual Studio running and ReSharper in there? So every IDE has a client and a server. Uh, we actually did some experiments with this. Um, actually saw an internal demo at some point where we had WebStorm subscribed to the writer protocol and uh, have syntax highlighting and refactorings for, uh, for C-sharp inside of WebStorm. We didn't ship it. Reason for that is it's, it's way too complex to maintain across all of the IDEs, but still it was a very cool tech demo and there was something in this idea, but um, I, I don't think this is gonna happen in the end, but it's still nice. Right, so uh, in summary of this entire talk, um, I know a lot of this is not going to be of practical use. What I wanted to do was give you a bit of background on what Rider is and how it is built, and that it's really two IDs communicating together across two different technology stacks. As a side effect, we have that protocol now, and we started thinking about what we can do with that protocol, which additional processes can we spin up on demand and share that protocol to contribute to uh, either side of the IDE and maybe even build micro UIs on top. Um, if there's anything you take away from this talk, try Rider if you want it, because there's a lot of technical stuff happening on the background and it's really interesting to uh, know and learn a little bit about that as well. With that, uh, thank you. And I'll, uh, I'll see the questions in Slack and on uh, WebEx now. There is one question about um, 50 projects in our solution and ReSharper in there, and ReSharper is slowing down the development process inside of Visual Studio. So um, is Rider the answer? Rider is an answer, um, I would say. So definitely give it a try if you want to try it. The downside is it's a different IDE. You have muscle memory. Maybe you have to relearn how you use your IDE. So if you're interested in that, try Rider. Uh, if not, Ping me, um, and I'll actually post a link in, uh, in Slack later on. We have a unconventional way of adding a directory.build.targets file next to your solution, where we disable parts of what Visual Studio is doing and uh, give ReSharper a little bit more memory. May work for you, may not work for you. So writer is an answer, maybe not the answer. You'll have to see. Any other questions? A couple people are typing. And the moment I say they are typing, the, the typing mark disappears, of course. Yeah, uh, could I just ask you, what's the idea of trying to make it so that you can use the different processes across the internet or a, a network? Do you want to connect uh, several people to uh, the same editor at once, or is it just a because you can? Is 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 this a trick question to ask if something like live share is coming to later? Maybe. Then the answer is maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it's it seems very cool, and it, nobody's ever done this before, uh, to my knowledge. So, really breaking the ground here. Yeah, so um, tacking on to that previous question about ReSharper, um, I mentioned at the start that one of the reasons that ReSharper and Visual Studio are having issues together, depending on the project size and so on, is that there's limited memory space available and you see that Microsoft is moving processes out of process and we are doing the same. So essentially we are rebuilding Rider now inside of ReSharper so that we can have uh, ReSharper run out of process in Visual Studio as well. But that's uh, that's taking longer than we anticipated because there's lots of things with come interrupt and so on that we have to bridge there. So that's uh, maybe an idea for an NDC next year or the year thereafter. <laughs>